Hey, what's happening? Right now, you are listening to the Victory Loves Company podcast. I'm Conrad Agderian. Today is Monday, April 23rd, 2018. And my next guest is a 19-year veteran at Bergen Community College. He's been teaching students about media, public speaking, speech, and communication since 1999. Professor Michael Eccles is an associate professor of communications and an academic advisor with a master's degree in communication from Indiana State University. Go Sycamores. Larry Bird, you. And, a, uh, and has a BA in communication at Key University in Union, New Jersey and is a, a marine cryptologist for four years. He has been one of the most influential professors of my six years of schooling. So without further ado, Professor Eccles, everyone. Professor, welcome to the show. Oh, Conrad, that is so cool. Thank you so much that I would be such an influence on you because you've turned out to be a very well-adjusted young man. Thank you, sir. So far. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's still early. <laughs> So, Professor, you age like fine wine, I do have to say. Oh, when I, thank when you. When I saw you. So, and according to uh, RateMyProfessor.com, you're, you're in the high, high fours, and you also sport the chili pepper, indicating your boyish good looks. So what's, the wow. secret to ha- so what's the secret to having brains and brawn? Okay, first off, my wife did not hear you say that one of them gave me the chili pepper. <laughs> but um, it's just, uh, I, I have to tell you, probably the thing that helps out the most is what I do for a living, mm-hmm. and that's spend so much time around young people. And every semester, they, you know, one of the things about you, here you are, a former student of mine, and you have matured, you've gotten a little older, you've gotten a little wiser. Talking with you today is different than talking with you, say, 10 or 12 years ago. But every semester, I'm talking to 19-year-olds. Every semester. They never age. Mm-hmm. And they've always got great things to say and great things to talk about. And I think you talk about how do I stay well I think that helps it really I'm 52 years old and although my knees feel 52 uh sometimes but uh, otherwise I always feel good coming into the classroom all right that's good I mean when I when I first started the podcast one of the first things that I did is I, I again I accrued a list of people that I wanted to have on here just to kind of get the settlementness out of the way professor um I chose to have you on the show because I wanted someone that was not a family member that greatly um, influence my life or my decision-making skills while I was still a young man. And there's a lot of things that, that you taught, whether it was classroom-related or even a story that you told that was kind of a, a side note, that really resonated with me. As soon as I compilated my list, like I said, you were amongst probably the first five people that I thought of. So I just wanted to thank you for your your influence. I think you did a great job and I know it'll resonate through me for the rest of my life. Well, thank you, Connor. And I have to tell you, you're one of the reasons why there are such great positive things about social media. Okay. People will always come on the downside of social media and the bullying, which is true. There's too much cyber bullying, Mm -hmm. but here you are a student that I had many years ago, but thanks to social media, we've been able to keep in touch. We'll send little comments to each other every once in a while. I get to see your progress to the adult that you've become and the man that you've become. And it's terrific. And now we're sitting here doing this podcast and it's not like I haven't seen you professor Eccles since I left Bergen. No, of course not. Because I've seen a lot of the things that you've done over the years. Uh, thank you. And it's so very cool that you're able to come in here today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you were uh, married. When did you get married? 2011? Yes, 2011. Yeah. Congratulations. And then thank you, you recently had a uh, little girl. My little baby girl, my princess. Your little princess? Talk about something keeping me young. Yeah? Uh, actually, she runs me ragged, but I uh, love her to death. And uh, I, mean, I waited a long time, but it was worth the wait. It's worth, yeah, it's definitely worth the effort, right? Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, some, certain things are still, uh, you know, mechanically sound so that at uh, the age of 51, I could become a dad for the first time, so. Good for you. Good for you. As long as you cross the finish line, you don't get points for style, right? <laughs> <laughs> I never heard it phrased that way, but that's a good way to put it, yes. As, as long as you cross, you don't get points for style, so. <laughs> All right, Professor, let's get down to the uh, meat and potatoes a little bit. Why don't you tell, for those who don't, don't know you that well, or at all, um, a little bit about yourself. I had mentioned that, uh, that you were a Marine for four years. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. You went to Indiana State. You went to Keene University, Keene University, excuse me. So, again, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself while you decided to, to choose this particular path? Well, I, had, um, <clears throat> well, I was in high school. I did a lot of activities, and I was class president. I did the morning announcements, and I did everything except for study. 
Uh, so by the time uh, college came along, and a lot of my friends were going to big schools, and I didn't know where to go, so I decided to come to Bergen, but I didn't take my studies seriously. So now after a semester, I decided not to come back to Bergen. All right, so what am I going to do? I'm 18 years old. I got a part-time job where I make 450 an hour, and I'm only working 15 hours a week. Mm-hmm. I got to do something. So that's when I decided, even though I had wanted to do it for a long time anyway, now there was no joy. The choice to make was to join the United States Marine Corps. And how old were you? I was 18 years old. 4.15 hour wasn't cutting it? <laughs> not, not 15 <laughs> hours a week, no. <laughs> All right. So uh, I decided to join the Marine Corps, and they uh, really kicked my butt. I had a very interesting job uh, working uh, in cryptology because what a lot of people didn't know, and even in the mid-1980s, the big Soviet bear mm-hmm. was still using Morse code for their military transmissions. Antiquated. So. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we had stopped doing it ourselves before World War II. Mm-hmm. So I knew Morse code very well, and I knew what the Soviets were doing, and that's what I did for four years. And when I got out in 88, I put a, a new focus on education, which wasn't easy mm-hmm. because all of my friends had graduated in 87. They did their four years of college, graduated. A year later, I'm starting from scratch. Right. So that wasn't easy, but I was able to do it. Um, they were very patient with me. Uh, and then, of course, after a year, um, a year after I graduated my bachelor's, I decided to uh, get my master's because, as you know, sometimes when you first get your bachelor's, you're real excited. You put out the applications and you don't get a nibble. I, I used to take that personally. You yeah. Know? And- I mean, especially when you're that young. You can't help but take it personally. It's like, well, why not? You know. And, yeah. then, and then when you say no, you're like, I F you. I didn't want to go there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you always want what you can't have. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like after a year, it's like, what am I doing? So I said, mm. but you know what? Let me try this. So I went, I applied to graduate school, which I never thought of. I saw an ad for Monmouth University, a grad school open house. Now, I wasn't going to go to Monmouth. Too expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but I decided to fill out a couple applications, got accepted to a couple places, and one of them gave me a graduate assistantship, and that was Indiana State University. So I packed up my car, drove 800 miles, Larry Bird University. There you go. You know, the one he made famous. And uh, I absolutely loved my time out there. I really loved it out there. Was there something that happened, whether it was your uh, tenure as a Marine or at Indiana State, that something went off in your head and you're like, this is the avenue that I want to travel? I would take away the financial incentive. Was there an instance that happened? Yes, it was the reality of radio. Radio. What happened was, is I get out to Indiana State, and even though I had a graduate assistantship, which of course is a tuition waiver, and then I just had to pay some fees, right. uh, but otherwise it was tuition waiver, I just had to teach a couple classes. I started working at a radio station on the weekends just to make some extra money. And then when I graduated with my master's, I did the morning show, and I did it for three years. The problem was the pay wasn't that great. There was a lot of pressure. In order to do well, as you may know from some of these New York City types, you've got to do the nomad thing. I wasn't ready to be a radio nomad. I didn't want to jump from Terre Haute to, you know, San Angelo, Texas to Seattle or, or, uh, you know, some Western Washington city to Boise, Idaho to, you know, and make Indianapolis maybe to Jacksonville, Florida. You would have to be the radio nomad. I decided I didn't want to do that. So then I realized, well, when I was a teaching, uh, a graduate assistant, I could teach the public speaking class. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could do that full time and I wouldn't have to wake up at 2.30 in the morning anymore. And there would be some job stability if I was able to get a full-time job. And that's what the determining factor was, was the reality of radio. I got you. Yeah. Is that what you did at Indiana? Radio? I did radio, morning radio for three years. Uh, most of it was at WMGI, Mix FM 100.7. Yeah. Uh, had a great time, though. I absolutely loved that for three years. Mm-hmm. And I wish, and I say this a lot, I wish most people could enjoy just one day of my life during that three years. It was that good? It was that. I had 50,000 watts every morning. And even though it wasn't a heavily populated area, I could go anywhere. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Shopping for my brother, I was getting him uh, a jersey at some sports store 20, 30 miles away from Terre Haute. And the young lady at the micro, or the young lady at the register said, uh, will there be anything else? And I just said, no, that'll be it. <gasps> oh, my God, you're Mike Eccles from XFM. I listen to you and Bo Richards every morning. <laughs> Just like that. That that was a typical day. So you had notoriety at that point. Big time. Good. Big time. I could go, uh, I would visit elementary or middle schools and have kids just mob me because we were the only top 40 station in the market. And so they had me every morning. Every morning they got up for school or was driv- driven to school, they were listening to Mix FM. So for three years, it was great. 
unfortunately, every two weeks, those were Terre Haute paychecks, uh, which I don't blame Terre Haute for. It's just a small market. Right. Yeah, but the experience that you got from it, the euphoria and the, the love of your job, you use that as kind of what you learned there and then applied it to later down the road. Well, I, I took a lot of what I learned on radio and applied it to what I do today. Besides teaching a you know public speaking or uh, speech communication class, teaching the mass media classes here at Bergen. But that's such a great skill to have, though. Public speaker. I'm not saying you got to be the the Clintons where you're making five hundred thousand a whack, but right. but just to have somebody that talks for a living and almost kind of borderline selling your personality on the radio and then turn around and have it as a class. I mean that just screams credibility right there as opposed to someone that just sat in a classroom and just said all right well in theory you should do this that and the other thing it's like no i'd rather take someone that was less educated i'm not saying that you are but i would take someone that was less educated but had more experience in the field professional experience exactly, right rather than just being academically smart but never worked a day in their life i've had professors like that too and they ended up being god awful you know so one of the things that i do when you talk about credibility is i'll talk about it and then i have some film clips of when i did work in radio you showed uh, you used to show them in between during the breaks i remember that yeah, yeah i used to say that and i'm like you know what even back then man i'm like you haven't you haven't aged <laughs> <laughs> oh you have you gotta tell me what kind of skin cream you use. just a wee bit <laughs> just a wee bit you look exactly the same as when i left uh my wife will tell you different but <laughs> i love her yvonne i love you baby well, if she's listening, I know she, yeah, she'll know that. So. Professor, what classes do you currently teach here at BCC? There is the COM 100, which is speech communication. That combines some public speaking, some COM theory, some group communication, which I really take important. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about professional experience. Right. Working in the private sector, we did a lot of group work, a lot of group meetings and conferences, you know, conference rooms. So I really take a, a, a quite a bit of time during the semester and talk about group communication. And then I take the, teach the intro to mass media, which I absolutely love. Because there's so much going on. Oh, and it's happening so quickly. I was just going to ask you that. What, what do you like to teach the most? Oh, the, the mass media. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I like to talk about my time in radio and television, but also just watching how quickly everything's changing. Well, when I took your media class, that was, um, uh, what is that? That was uh, fall of 2007. Mm-hmm. At the time, I think Facebook was just starting to become for everybody and not just for college students. Right. And even then, 11 years before this, this conversation right now, you were talking about the transfer of information and how fast it was. And you even gave a specific example about something that happened. I don't know if it was in Miami or it was in Cuba. Something happened within, it happened at like eight o'clock. And again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing your story. Yeah. Something happened around seven, eight o'clock in the morning. By noontime, there were t-shirts that were made up of what had happened. Oh, I, that was the Elian Gonzalez Is that incident. what it was? Yeah. It was in uh, 2000. It was right before Clinton left office. Okay. And, and what happened was, is that at 6 a.m. when they snatched uh, the, the, the uh, F, no, I'm sorry, the... Um, it was one of the government agencies that grabbed Elian Gonzalez from one of the people he was staying with. Mm-hmm. And, of course, had a gun pointed at the person holding Elian Gonzalez. He was only six years old. By 11 a.m., that picture that was taken by somebody at 6 a.m. was now on T-shirts all over Miami for right. people who were against Elian going back to Cuba. Mm-hmm. And it was just amazing. You know, I'm not talking about the political side of it. I'm just talking about the rapid movement of that picture of taking it from that phone and putting it into a computer. Because at the time, I think you still had to take the phone and plug it into a computer and then take the picture off the computer. It's not like what we do today. Well, well, it was similar to uh, digital cameras because right around then, digital cameras were starting to... Oh, it wasn't a phone. You're right. It probably was a digital camera. Yeah, because, I mean, phones, they're... Megapixels were very, very low. Right, but, but you could it take camera, it, plug it into yeah, the... you had to plug it into a laptop, and then it was, yeah. Because that, that was a weird thing at the time, is the ability to have a camera that could take three or 400 photos. Yeah. Now you could take, you know, three or 400,000 photos <laughs> on your phone. You don't even need the camera. But yeah, no, I, I, I agree. But even in 2000, just the spread of information and how quick it was like that. Amazingly quick. And again, 11 years before that, the term Twitter wasn't even in my vocabulary. <laughs> so now, now, nowadays, that picture would have been spread all over the place place everybody would be tweeting about it you know it's it, it's even quicker so if that happened at seven eight in the morning people had t-shirts worn by noon now if it happens at 826 by 843 over 100,000 people already know what happened and by 849 there's already memes being made up oh yeah people will be putting their own pictures on there or putting their sister's picture on there you know you would have your sister's picture over Elian Gonzalez's face or something like that oh yeah it, it would yeah it, it is amazing in 2018 
how how we've moved. As a matter of fact, a student asked me the other day in class, do you worry sometimes about what it's going to be like for your daughter in the future when she turns 18? Right. And I said, no, I think it's going to be fantastic. I mean, think about where we've come now. You just talked about this from 2000 to 2018. That's 18 years. My daughter in 16 years will be 18. What is it going to be like then? I know. What is it going to be like? And I'm excited to see what it's going to be like. That's what makes me, that's what drives me in this class, makes the mass media class so much fun. It's certainly going to get better. I mean, yeah, like every generation says that the generation before them was easier. Like, oh, I remember the days where I could leave my keys in my car. You know, or I remember the days where I could leave my door unop- uh, you know, unlocked and yeah. everything was fine. It's like, all right, mm, you know, gone are those days. But I'm not that old. Neither are you. And I can turn around and say, yeah, you know what? I remember, I, I remember 15 years ago when, you know, you could leave your phone unlocked. That's my generation's <laughs> problem, you know? So for your daughter, she could turn around and say, oh, you know, I can't believe you guys lived in a world where, you know, you couldn't, you, know, you didn't have to lock your phones. Right. You know, now, I, I'll, I'll give you a big reason why I'm optimistic. No, I'm, I, I, I'm not downplaying it. Just right. So you know. I'm, no, I'm just, still saying, no, no, but I, I still want to say I know about things like cyberbullying, about t- stealing information, stealing people's identities. I know that's still a big problem right. when it calls, comes to the world of cyber. With that said, okay, one of the things I tell my students when you talk about how technology is going now, I said, I still remember, because, you know, I'm old enough to remember, mm-hmm. if you didn't get to the bank by Friday at four o'clock, you had no cash for the weekend because <laughs> there were no such thing as ATMs. And of course, nowadays, no. you know, you take your phone. You can Venmo people. You, you, you know, you, know, yeah. you just PayPal uh, it. the PayPal it or uh, however they do with the scan and that nowadays. Oh, come on, Professor. It won't sound old. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, but I, 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 I could not remember what it's called. But I mean, because I have it on my phone. I could take my I phone know. and scan it and not have to worry about right. getting cash or having money on me. But the other thing was. I, I told this story the other day in, in, to my students. It's like, yeah, everybody. And sometimes I'm like those people who like lark for the past. And oh, I hark back to the way it used to be. Two years ago, I'm with my wife. We stop at a pharmacy mm-hmm. on a Saturday afternoon in Wanakew, New Jersey, which is northern Passaic County. While she's in the pharmacy, I'm waiting in the car. And on my phone, in 1080 HD, I'm watching Indiana State play Western Illinois in a college football game on my phone. <laughs> now, you're going to tell me that there's bad things about the way technology is moving? I agree. I, I, I just, agree. I see too many of the positives, and I think, I think they, the negatives get the press play, but I think the because positives that, that, outweigh the negatives. Because that's what draws eyeballs. That's yeah. what generates cash revenue. I, we need more people like you, man. <laughs> we need more people that need to see the glasses being half full here. Absolutely. You know, you know, everybody likes to focus on the bad because, again, we live in a world where uh, bad stuff gets uh, gets the attention and almost gets rewarded. You know, somebody uh, commits a terroristic act, they're going to be on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. I'll give but, you another example. Okay. Talk about the iPhone. Okay. And it doesn't matter iPhone, Samsung, smartphone. Yeah. In August, I had some work that needed to be done in my car. My wife had to go work. It was the last week of August, so she was back to work. Is this your Maserati or your Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> my Jeep Grand Cherokee. Yeah, all right. Um, so I'm sitting, and my, my daughter was at daycare. So um, I decided that it was going to take about five hours. They said, do you want a car to take you home? I said, no, I'll just wait here. So as I'm waiting those five hours, I take my phone, I plug in the headset, the headset punch my HBO Go app, and I just decided to just pick and choose five different episodes of The Sopranos. Nice. How can you say that, you know, for people who do, who are so negative, because I've met many of the ones you're talking about. Right. How can you say it's so negative when I can sit on Route 23 in Butler, New Jersey, and watch unedited, uncensored episodes of The Sopranos on my phone? I know. And all of a sudden, five hours waiting for my car to be done goes like that. It's too good. I know. And I'm loving every, you know, talking about it every day in class, talking about the new things that, you know, when, when new articles come up, new news stories about what's happening. You should have no shortage of that, though. There's always something coming always. out. Espe- always. Especially te- tech is the big thing right now. There's we're, we're, always. In one of my computer classes, um, when I was up at Ramapo, uh, one of my professors, one of the things that they made us do was once a week, everybody had to bring in an article, something new or current. Mm-hmm. And almost... Every one of them, being as part of the millennial generation, almost every one of them was either Apple related, Google related, okay? They would always talk about how Google acquired this company, 
Facebook acquired this company, whatever. Everything was always tech related. It's like, is there anything that's maybe just not tech related? But again, there's just, there's no, there's no shortage there. There's no shortage, but I think sometimes it's actually helpful. You know, one of the things I remember uh, two years ago was I was looking online for, or was it three years ago? I was looking online for a new um, snowblower. And of course I went to like Home Depot, I went to Lowe's.com. Mm -hmm. Well, next thing you know, my Facebook comes back up and I've got a bunch of ads for snowblowers. Oh. Well, you know what? It was actually helpful because I was then able to find the one that I wanted, the one that I have now for uh, the last three years. Okay. Uh, so, you know, people will say, oh, they're stealing your information. Well, you know, maybe sometimes I'm glad they got that because it the, helped me to purchase that snowblower. Their argument is going to be they're trying to make your experience better yes. with, with the internet. I think that's called um, geofencing or geotracking. It's something along those yes. lines. It's, it's like the new digital marketing. Thing. Well, not new, but it's the digital marketing thing. Even when I took out ads for my business, one of the first things they wanted to know is, is this something you're interested in or do you want to do a commercial? I actually did do a commercial, believe it or not. Um, it was a digital one, but I, I showed my face on it back when I had platinum hair. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, but yeah, it was the way she was explaining it to me. It's like, well, if, you know, if somebody's looking for if somebody's looking for a bag, you know, mm -hmm. and somebody's searching for it, all the other competitors will be basically kind of like almost like pop up. Yes. So, for, so for example, if you're looking for, you know, like a green duffel bag, right, and you are selling duffel bags, even though they're not looking for yours, your ad is going to pop up because it's a related field. Right. And then you can, try, you can narrow it down to, do you want to focus on just Bergen County? Do you want to focus, focus on just New Jersey? Do you want to focus on a New York metro area? And, and my business was, it would actually be te technically classified as local, not regional, because regional yes. would kind of span into kind of other states. Now, while I do service New York and Connecticut, there's a, a radius that I adhere to. As much as I would love to take gigs down to Miami, you know, you're going to have to put me up. I fly only first class. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm not quite there yet. It was the same thing. So if people were searching, you know, renting a photo booth for a wedding, which is something that I do. Right. You know, and, they, and a competitor would pop up before me because they spend more money in advertising than I do or they're mm -hmm. bigger than me. Lo and behold, my photo booth is going to pop up on the side. And if they click on that and they like what they hear, guess what? I booked a photo booth for 600 bucks, whereas initial, uh, the initial viewing they were looking at was like for 700. So to speak to your point, it's like, yeah, they are tracking what you're doing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not denying that. But because of their tracking, because of this gathering of information, they are now able to tailor things that you want at a lower price point or maybe at a closer outlet. If you were looking at a snowblower at Lowe's, maybe the one in Home Depot was cheaper and closer. Yes. So everybody, everybody wins. But we also got to remember, and, and, and I really want people to realize this, why do you think Facebook's been free for so long? Why do you think Facebook has been free? Think about all the things you do on Facebook. Hell, right. I get on Facebook every morning. First thing I do, I got to play my Bejeweled Blitz. <laughs> I got to play my games. That's okay. Good. There are some really advanced computer games on Facebook okay. for free. I connect every day with old Marine Corps buddies or old high school friends, mm -hmm. uh, old college friends, people I used to know in Indiana every day. I might chat with them or send a comment. How is that all free? Well, it's because of those who are looking to get my information. It's not only information, but it's they want you to stay on the site longer. Sure. And, and also I've learned too, because um, I have a YouTube channel for, for my business, not for this, yeah. is that you would think that shorter videos, like under 10 minutes, would be ideal because people can watch it and then move along, and that's how you get hits. But as it turns out, that's not the case. YouTube actually likes longer videos. Now, why do you think that is? Because they want you to stay on YouTube.com right. for as long as possible because they want you to stay there. They don't want you to go someplace else. Anyway, my, my, point, my point is, is um, information is now, the, is now the, the, the new currency and just the ability to gather it, even with the Amazon Alexa. They want to be in every one of your rooms. Yes. Do you have one? No, but I, I've seen them. I'm, again, I'm not a promoter or whatever the opposite of a promoter is, for, but <laughs> I, I just I don't see the advantage of bugging your own house because <laughs> because that information it's it's always being monitored. Yeah, you never you know? know where and it's it, going. It's like, hey Alexa, you know, uh, buy uh, you know buy diapers or whatever it is, and it's just like, no, I, I'm not going to bug my own house. It's just I I try my best to opt out for, it, but you know what? It's like it's like a rainstorm. You you can do your best to get 
wet, but eventually you're going to get hit with rain. So you might as well just kind of deal with it. But that's a great, that's a great saying. I like that. I made that one up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's hey, look, you can, you can carry the umbrella. You can wear the rain jacket, but the bottom line is you're going to get wet anyway. You're going to so, get wet. So you just got to have to play the game, but it's all about progress. People that seem very content, very happy like yourself. They see it as, you know, well, it's, it's rosy. Like, look, like only five years ago, I wasn't able to watch anything on my phone. Now I can get my car repaired and I can be entertained at the same time. Everybody wins. It's unbelievable what you can do with these things right now, these, these smartphones and some of the other streaming technology that's coming out. It is just amazing. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I know that the other part, especially those uh, associated with social media, are the ones who are coming down, especially old Zuckerberg is taking some serious heat right now. Yeah, right now he is. Yeah. But you know yeah. what? That's what it was set up to do. He's been doing it for a long time. He'll, ba- he'll bounce back from that, though. Oh. Yeah, he'll, he'll bounce back. Nobody's dropping Facebook. Nobody, yeah, I, I don't, I didn't suddenly hear of several hundred thousand or millions of people suddenly closing their Facebook accounts. No, they're, they're too big for that. Can't do that because it, I got to see what my, you know, that person I was in third grade with. Mm-hmm. What are they doing tomorrow? What are they doing with their grandchildren? I got to know. I didn't lose any friends yet. Yeah, I didn't lose any either. Yeah, none so of them closed so what, out. What the hell are people talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this is common in other areas of the country, but certainly, certainly, not, in, certainly not on this end. I don't no. know anybody that rebelled against it. I don't even know businesses that, that pulled from it. The consumers are saying we like Facebook. I got to play my bejeweled blitz. I'm not leaving. I don't start my morning without it. There's a trend that I've noticed in my through my through my schooling, and that was the the stories resonated with me, and they 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 were very salient in my mind. And I don't know why. And that, that was true with a lot of my professors, even the professors that that I liked. And one of the stories that you had mentioned was we were talking about uh, Rupert Murdoch, 1994. And the whole NFL, was it Fox? Oh, wow. What, 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 yeah. Okay. But you were talking about innovative people right. in television, you know, and, and since you have a, a little bit of a broadcasting background, I could see how this can be an area of, of interest, as it is to me, because I'm a nerd like that. Too. <laughs> so my question was, what Rupert Murdoch, are they doubled or tripled the offer for something? You, again, you'll have to clarify. You have it, to this apologize. was one of the most amazing things in the history of broadcasting mm-hmm. and really set the map for what was going to happen for many years to come. For the longest time, since pretty much the beginning of television, CBS had televised in their markets the National Football League slash National Football Conference games. Since 1962, I think after they left ABC, but some, from 1962 through 1994, NBC had done the American Football League slash American Football Conference games. Mm -hmm. And then ABC had Monday Night Football. And when Cap Cities owned both ABC and ESPN, they would also have the Sunday Night Football games. And that's the way it was. That's the way it was always going to be. Every four years, the NFL renewed their rights contracts with these networks. Same people, same thing. So as they were doing it again, after the 19, I think it was after the 1994 season, Murdoch calls the NFL just as they were finishing negotiations. And he says, so how much did CBS offer for the NFC games? Was it like, like, like $500 Like $530 million dollars for four years. Mm-hmm. He almost triples it. Okay, it was over a billion dollars he offered. And of course, CBS went ballistic. They're trying to find every ounce of, you know, every penny they can to try to scrape up to try to get close. They couldn't match the offer. So now all of a sudden, you have... Affiliates Now, most television markets, like the smaller ones, only have three stations. So at the time, ABC, NBC, CBS. There were a lot of markets that did not have a Fox affiliate at the time. And Murdoch knew that. So what happened was, now I watched this. Is that why he came in so high? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I watched it happen in Terre Haute. See, in Terre Haute, they had a CBS and an NBC affiliate, and then a a UHF station that was Fox, uh, that was uh, ABC. Within three days after Murdoch completed this move with the NFL, that affiliate switched to a Fox affiliate. Why? Because you were right in the middle of Bears country. Um, And you're going to tell people now they can't watch the Chicago Bears? Yeah. Because this was Murdoch's theory. Who am I getting now with, with, with this deal? I'm getting the New York Giants, market number one. I'm getting the Los Angeles Rams, who were still in L.A. at the time, market number two. I'm getting the Chicago Bears, market number three. I'm getting the Philadelphia Eagles, market number four. I'm getting the Dallas Cowboys, market number five. Okay? Uh, I think market number six at the time was Atlanta or someone uh, close to that. Okay? 
Oh, excuse me, San Francisco. I'm getting the San Francisco 49ers. Oh, the Niners. Okay. So yeah. Murdoch yeah. knew he was now going to command all the top markets. Now, here's what he did, especially during the first season he had football. He promoted the heck out of all of his shows. So let's say you have a play going on. Okay, Giants are playing, let's say, the Redskins. Ty Wheatley runs the ball. He's tackled second and seven. And as he's going back to the huddle, don't forget, Bart Simpson tonight with the Simpsons at 730 <laughs> Eastern right here on Fox. I mean, you would see Bart Simpson running across the screen and uh-huh. then just after a play was over or, uh, you know, they were talking about 21 Jump Street or Melrose Place. Right. Or, he promoted all of his primetime shows during those NFL broadcasts. And before you knew it, that money he spent, He was making it back and then some. It was amazing that move that he made because he acquired so much, even spending twice, if not three times as much as what CBS was offering, Mm -hmm. but he acquired so much more. And everybody, so it wasn't just a four-year thing. It was almost kind of like a a permanent thing. Well, because after four years, nobody was going to match it. CBS couldn't match it again. So what CBS did, which was hysterical, Mm -hmm. is four years later, CBS is now for the first time in like 45 years has not had football. So four years later, they snatched the AFC from NBC. (laughs) (laughs) They outbid NBC for the AFC game. Now NBC's got no football. So of course, eventually NBC would then get the Sunday night game, which is a very popular uh, time slot for them right now. They do draw about 18 to 20 million uh, every Sunday. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was funny to watch because you had the same for so long. And Murdoch and Fox just came in and just blew it all up. And it's an amazing moment in broadcasting history. He just almost tripled the offer. But my question is, where did he get a hold of that kind of like money? Like, what was to stop somebody else from coming? Because I don't think at that point he was really a household name. He I wasn't think, a I household think. name here, but in England and Australia and other parts of Europe, with Sky News and the Sky Corp, uh, he was known. I mean, uh, his media company was very well known around the world. News Corp, right? News Corp. Now he was here in some places, but it was Fox that really put him on the map. So it was very innovative on his behalf. Oh, hugely innovative. I mean, it was it literally blew everything up and something that had been in place for, what, since 1962, pretty much? Yeah. Or since ABC got Monday Night Football in 1970. So from 1970 to 1994, with the exception of then ESPN coming along and getting the Sunday night game, it just all stayed the same. Mm-hmm. And he came in with the big bucks and blew it all up. And without it, I got American Idol... There would never have been the number, almost through the entire decade from 2001 to 2011, there would not have been the number one show. And for those who don't like it, the number (laughs) one news network, which is the Fox News Channel, would not have probably existed if it wasn't for that move. Super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All all because he saw saw an opportunity, right place at the right time. Absolutely. And he did, it was the smartest move. Immediately, he acquires the rights to games in 13 of the top 15 television markets in America. Mm -hmm. Smart move. Yeah. And and now he's a uh, multi-multi-billionaire because of it. Eh, he's 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 kind of like uh, not doing much anymore. I think uh, his children have taken over the business. It's, it's, he's like two hundred years old. Yeah, at know? least at least two hundred. What? Well, I know AT T is trying to buy. Um, oh, there is. Yeah, I heard. I saw this recently. Oh, and I don't remember exactly who it is. Time Warner. The ATT wanted to purchase Time Warner. I know he was definitely a part of that, but being the antique that he is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. But uh, I know they want ATT wanted to buy it for I think it's something like fifty two billion dollars and. I, again, I guess maybe they're trying to be more innovative or maybe they're just trying to create a monopoly, but even they're going so far as the, the, the feds are stepping in and are kind of saying, like, no, you can't do that. And their argument is like, look, we're not acquiring a company that's the same of the same as ours because that would be a monopoly. I'll put monopoly right. in quotes. It's they offer similar services, but they're not identical. I know every once in a while, I'm not usually a big fan of the government stepping in this time they may have had to. You can make that argument with Amazon, too, that are they really a monopoly? Are they a retail monopoly? Or or is it that their competitors just can't compete? I, I'll agree with the one point that you made. I just don't think anybody's caught up to them. You know, they've got a business model that has worked extremely well. But you think about what Walmart is doing. Yeah, I think it is the largest company in the in the world. They make almost uh, they make over a quarter of a trillion dollars a year. Ten generations now, they do oh not have to worry about God. cash. Right? They don't worry about any of that. Walmart also recently came out with, hey, if you order from online, we promise we'll get it to, to you in in, uh, in two days right. or less. I'm like, all right. 
I see what you're doing here. I'm like, but you're about 10 years too late. That company was very sluggish with it. So look, nobody's forcing you to go there, but they, may, they certainly make it easy to say, well, if I need a new cell phone case, do I want to schlep to the store and get it for 10 bucks, or do I want to have it delivered to my door for eight and I have more of a variety to choose from? They're able to provide something for people that would otherwise not be able to afford it. One of the things about Toys R Us, I know a lot of people are upset, a lot of people are crying, you know, Toys R Us out of business, they're saying maybe that Amazon has something to do with it. You know what? It's not a coincidence. When I first yeah. got out of the Marine Corps mm-hmm. and I went Christmas shopping, I went to A&S, I went to Stearns, I went to Steinbeck's, I went to James Way, I went to Bradley's. I remember Bradley's. These are yeah. all stores that no longer exist. Okay? It happens. When I was a little kid, my dad would take me, and I used to love the orange uh, drinks at Two Guys. You're not going to remember Two yeah, Guys. Yeah, this is before my time. Yes, that was before your time, <laughs> but Two Guys was a very popular department store. It happens. I know. So Toys R Us, just somebody came up with a better business model, just like people had better business models than the other stores I just you know mentioned. So as much as I'm... Yeah, Toys R Us, sure, they're leaving. It's going to be sad for some of the employees. Those are the ones I feel the worst for, people who work for Toys R Us. But for those who shop there and are upset about, hey, you know what? Somebody came up with a better business model. If it happened to be Amazon, that's the way it happens. And Amazon is doing a really good business right now. It's one that people love. And that one, like you were saying, I mean, you're giving me, would I rather go out and spend $10 or stay at home and get it for $8? Exactly. Being able to access anything that you bought on Amazon. You saw my jacket, the Marine Corps jacket that yeah, I have, yeah, yeah, the yeah. bomber jacket, only cost me 50 bucks. I got it on Amazon. That's a good deal. I wear it to my Marine Corps League meetings. The guys love it. it cost me 50 bucks. I got it through Amazon. So, hey, you want to come up with something better, people? Come up with something better. I'll buy my jacket there. I'll buy my food there. I'll buy my other gifts there. You know what? If it, if it wasn't Amazon, it would have been somebody else. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, you know, look, absolutely. Toys R Us, look... Going in there was like going to a theme park. I love running up and down the aisles and just imagining what would it be like if I had this in my room? You know, what would it be like if, you know, because I used to like to raise, going there wasn't just a toy store. It was an experience, right? you know, and I enjoyed it. Every time I go there, I would get a movie, uh, you know, a DVD or whatever it was, VHS, you know. and The world's biggest toy store, yeah. Toys R Us, yeah. the biggest selection, Toys R But you know what? You know, I met the, uh, the CEO. Of Toys R Us? Uh, Dave Brandon mm-hmm. is his name. And I was doing a gig for him right over here in, in, uh, in Paramus, right. Right, on route, right on Route 4. And they were doing something where they were having like a fake debate and the, pers- and the kid, there were kids. And, you know, it wasn't taken seriously. And like whoever won would get, you know, a $100 gift card. And Dave Brandon rolls up. And my client who hired me, hired me to do um, – a popcorn and cotton candy cart mm-hmm. did bang out for the kids and they had Jeffrey the giraffe there and the, it was a cool experience and usually when I work and I meet high end people I don't want to bum rush them I try to maintain that level of professionalism so but I had the opportunity to meet Dave Brandon and being a being a business owner I mean that's like meeting a celebrity you know what I mean so if, you, if you're a Giants fan and you're able to meet um, Eli Manning it's, you know what I mean it's, a, it's the equivalent and I'm like, all right, I don't want to just go up to him and just, because I suck at icebreakers. So I'm like, let me think of something here. I said, what's going to be my end? Because obviously everyone wants to shake his hand. Everybody's talking yeah. to him, whatever. So I go up to him. I said, um, and I joked about it. I said, I will be damned if my two-year-old daughter did not allow me the opportunity to shake the person's hand who's going to be responsible for her childhood memories or something. It was like <laughs> something like that. And he starts laughing about it. So we shake his hand. I have my, my employee take a couple of pictures with my, uh, with my cell phone. And I remember I blasted that all over my social media page. So there's me there like standing and he's holding like a vat of cotton candy. And I'm sitting, <laughs> sitting there like an idiot. I'm like, ah, here's Dave. You know? Wait, do you have a two-year-old? No. <laughs> no, I didn't think so. You deceptive. I had to get in there and do what oh. I was supposed to do. I didn't want to be like, oh my God, I really wanted to. Look, I didn't, have, I didn't know the icebreaker. So I I'm like, hope this guy's not listening right now. No, wait, I can always edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, but actually how, um, how ironic that was because, because of the joke that I said. And I'm just like, you know, I want to meet the person that's going to be responsible for my kid's happiness, you know, growing up. Now that he's out of a job at Toys R Us, somebody, somebody will pick him up. You know, somebody, somebody, somebody of that stature. It's and a it, powerhouse, and, and especially you know we're here in New Jersey. 
Wayne is where their corporate headquarters is, and I know some people right. that work over there, and they're going to they're going to eventually what, lose their job. One Jeffrey, yeah, the, the street is named after. Yeah, him. I think it is Jeffrey Lane, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Jeffrey Road or something. Oh, Je- yeah, so um, I, that's going to happen, and that's who I'm sad for. But they couldn't compete anymore. Somebody was competing better than them, and it's a brand name that'll you know, like I said, whether it's James Way, whether it's Bradley's, whether it's A and S. A and S was huge. Abraham and Strauss. What you're telling me now is what you're going to tell your daughter about Toys R Us. And you're going to say, yeah, you know what? I remember when Toys R Us was around, and this is what they used to offer. And she's going to look at you really weird. And she's going to be like, wait, you had to go into a store to buy toys? You mean you could walk through and, yeah. like, there would be nothing but toys? Yeah, I mean, you had to interact with people to get like, what you wanted. I'm like, oh my God, Dad. I mean, it's bad enough that you're so old, Dad. You're like, hang on. <laughs> like, you're 90 years old, and all the other fathers are, like, 30. <laughs> I'm expecting that already, so. Well, 52 is the new 32. Yeah. How about the, that? The, the new 45, probably. <laughs> I wouldn't say 32. I'd say about 45. No, you're, you're, young. <laughs> you're young at heart. Come on. You're young at heart. I'm so. trying. All right, Professor. We certainly went over a lot of different topics here. And, again, I appreciate your time. You're very knowledgeable, as you always are. And I always try to will be. be. So um, is there anything else that you'd like to um, add? Do you have any advice for anybody that's listening? The only advice I would have, it's something I tell a lot of my students who want to succeed, no matter what field it is. Mm-hmm. Okay, if it, You always want to do something that you love to do. Okay? Agreed. But if you want to do something that you want to do, then be prepared to do what you have to do. A lot of times I think young people aren't prepared to do what they have to do. And I've always felt that I was hesitant to do that, but then after I did it, I was glad I did whether it was... Go in the Marine Corps. Now at 18 years old, I'm going to separate from my family completely right. for a number of years. Right. Um, or even when I went, you know, after graduating from Kane and the jobs were not coming, I went to grad school. So I had to separate myself 800 miles from my family. Mm-hmm. But I did what I had to do. If I had to work weekend overnights on a radio station because I needed extra money and that was the only shift available, I did what I had to do. Right now, as you say, I'm in a very good place in my life and I feel really good. And it's because of that. So my, my biggest advice to anybody listening, especially young people, if you want to do what you want to do for the rest of your life, be prepared to do what you have to do. If you're going to be in it, you've got to be in it all the way or not in it at all and not to half-ass it. And, you know, as, as you've you know, morphed into the, the man that you are now, you, you take those lessons and you just kind of take it from point A to point B and from point B to point C. And just, are, are you happy? Is I, the bottom line. I am more happy than I think most people could ever be. You know, you know what, I was, what, what I never understood is this artificial timeline that people put on other people and on themselves. Like, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you own a home? When are what, you what getting you married? Oh, I get that. When are you getting yeah. married? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, it's like a checklist, but nobody ever asks you, are you happy? It's like, it doesn't matter do, if you own a home. It doesn't matter if you're making four fifty an hour at your job. In my opinion, that doesn't really matter. The bottom line is, are you happy? Because some people would be very content making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, having a five-minute commute to work over having a $150,000 job, but their commute is an hour and a half each way. Without the accidents. Without the, ac- yeah. without the accidents or being crammed into a, a Jeremy subway car or something like that. You know, So time is is what I value and it seems that you do too so um, you practice what you preach you certainly display that in the classroom and I think students myself included are very fortunate to have somebody like that um, in their lives oh, Wh- thank you whether it's for just a couple hours a week or if it resonates 12 years later like it does now so I hope that it just keep doing it, keep doing what you're doing man you're, you're killing it thank you you're, Conrad you're absolutely I, crushing it I'm very happy to say that you're one of the many uh, on Facebook students who I've been proud of over the years who I continue to stay in touch with thank you and I think social media has helped that tremendously and you know I hope some of them are listening maybe some of your classmates true from when we were here at Bergen that's true <laughs> actually I've won my I did a I did a gig for BCC um not this campus uh for the Sierra Center in Hackensack yes and I didn't even know you guys had one in Lyndhurst yes and we did something for Valentine's Day and actually, when I'm done here, I'm going to go and see her. I told her I was going to be here. I'm going to look at my phone. And I'm going to see what room I got to meet her in. But you guys built a maze around here, and I have no idea where I'm going now. <laughs> so now, now I'm that guy that people would come up to and be like, excuse me, how do I get to room you know, S339? And I'm like, oh, go that way. Now I'm that guy asking the question. So how, how full circle I've come. Listen, 
Preston, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And thank I want to thank you for, for coming on. I think you gave a lot of good advice here. And, uh, and you have nothing but confidence. So thank you for that. And I wish you continued success with this fabulous podcast. Thanks, Conrad. All right, everyone. I think that should do it. Um, you've been listening to the Victory Loves Company podcast. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. As usual, if you have any questions for any upcoming shows, please email us at thevictorypodcast at gmail. Dot com, as well as to check us out on our social media handles at VLC Podcast. And I'll talk to you next week.